Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear AXAF partners, thank you very much for joining us today. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to the ninth session of the IKU AXAF on green hydrogen for aviation. Once again, I'm very pleased to see so many of you joining us today. My name is Jane Hoopy. I'm the director in charge of the environment program at IKU. I'm here with IKU officers working on fuels and AXAF as well as with the focal points on environment from the IKEA regional offices. Today's training on green hydrogen for aviation was requested by many of you in the context of our survey launch at the end of last year. Therefore, I'm very happy that we are able to deliver it and even happier that we can count on the precious support of seven key actors in the ecosystems of green hydrogen for aviation to deliver this series. We'll introduce them in a moment. As usual, before diving into the topic of the day, we'll provide you with one update on IKU's ongoing activities to develop the AXAF program and deliver the highest value for our states. We'll also provide an update on the recent developments from our partners, which we're capturing in our track performance. Our few officers will present in detail all those developments, but allow me first to highlight a few important issues that just uh, uh, came about. So last year, as you know, we concluded three additional SAF uh, feasibility studies for the states of Cote d'Ivoire, Rwanda, and Zimbabwe. The final reports are published on the IK website, and it is now that report in the hands of the respective states. Those states will continue to engage in order to transform the findings of these studies into concrete SAF projects. We will continue to support them. 2024 will be a crucial year as we will considerably accelerate the pace of delivering more SAF feasibility studies. Thanks for the funding from the European Union, France, the Netherlands, and the United Kingdom, our intention is to launch around 20 more SAF feasibility studies and business implementation reports during this year and beyond. We are also finalizing cooperation with AXAF industry partners to further increase the number of states. We will significantly accelerate the capability of states across all region to launch their national SAF industry. The aim is as soon as possible to have SAF being produced in all regions of the world in the spirit of IKEA's No Country Left Behind approach. Importantly, as we did in 2023 to deliver the IKEA template for the SAF feasibility studies, this year, we will develop, uh, together with our SAC partners, an IKEA template for business implementation report. Consultation with you, and uh, you know, mainly with the expertise we have in our SAF on economics and financing of SAF projects will be key for the successful of this new uh, undertaking. The template will be essential to ensure consistency of the business implementation reports. And it will be most useful for investors to find the information they need to make business decisions and engage in funding SAF projects. Now, coming back to today's training. The objective will be to provide you with knowledge on green hydrogen for aviation, its production, and its use for SAF production processes. This event is indeed very timely, as we are seeing an increasing interest in green hydrogen in our member states. As an example, just yesterday, we noted the inclusion of SAF in the EU Net Zero Industry Act, the NCIA, which already includes renewable hydrogen as one of the key technologies and indispensable in reaching the EU 2030 climate targets and 2050 climate neutrality. To this end, the European Hydrogen Bank we we'll also aim to support the uptake of renewable hydrogen within the EU, as well as imports from international partners and unlock private investments 
in hydrogen value chains. This is why we have invited speakers who can explain green hydrogen from several angles. To that end, we have an exceptional, exceptional uh, lineup of speakers. First, we have Luis Janeiro, team lead and the international at the International Renewable Energy Agency, who will share with us the views of IRENA on the role of and prospects of green hydrogen for the carbonization of air transport. From a technical perspective, we welcome Sari Mikkelsen and Matthias Madsen, business development managers at Topso, who will explain how green hydrogen is produced and what is the role of green hydrogens in the production process of SAF and e-fuels. In the following presentations, thanks to Alexander Mombazet, Structure Market Reference at uh, Q Air Energy, you will learn all about the ongoing development of a project to build a green hydrogen and e-fuel production facility. Then we thought it would be key to provide the perspective of an aircraft manufacturer, and we'll hear from Nicholas Landring, Hydrogen Infrastructure Development at Airbus, who will explain their vision for the development of a green hydrogen ecosystem. After that, we'll move on two presentations by Chile and Japan on their national strategy for the development of green hydrogen, including in, for aviation. In order, we will give the floor to Luis Ignacio Castillo, coordinator of the green hydrogen area in the Agencia of Sustainabilidad e Genetica of Chile, and then to Mr. Ojira, um, Eji Ojira, strategic architect of the fuel cell and hydrogen at NEDO, Japan. We are very grateful for their participation and crucial input to this training. I cannot emphasize enough the crucial role of ACTSAF partner states in supporting this entire ACTSAF uh, program. We are tremendously lucky to count on the support and expertise of our speakers today, and I would like to address them a very warm thank you. Let's now take a quick look at the agenda for this training. Before leaving the floor to our speakers, I'll pass the floor to Dr. Bruno Silva, who will give you an update on the ICAO ACSAF activities, and will provide a quick overview of the importance of hydrogen for the production of SAF. Then we will move to those presentations, which will be given in sequence. After the final presentation, we'll save time, hopefully around 20, 30 minutes, for a session of questions and answers that will be moderated by IK. Now, as always, I hope you will make full use of this section to ask questions. Please raise your hand or post your questions in the chat and we will do our best to address it during the Q&A. Your questions may also be targeted directly to our speakers today. We encourage every participant to make today's training as interactive and collaborative as possible. Let me mouth Pass the floor to our staff officer, Dr. Bruno Silva, and let me wish you all a very, very pleasant ACSAF training. Thank you. Bruno. Thank you, Jane. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. So uh, as we have been always doing, like we'll all start this event like by providing an update on the ACSAF program, where we stand and, and what are our next steps on the program. So uh, if it's our first time here, like uh, we are including all the information in our platform. So I really invite you, we always show this slide here, like, and we, we are happy that we reached like 150 ACTSAFT partners with 90 states and 60 organizations. And the list is on the port on the website and all the details on the program and the and also this ACTSAFT series, the videos and the presentations, everything's there on the website. And I would like just like hearing, uh, we heard the feedback from our partners like on the <clears throat> on the survey. And uh, and we'd like to highlight here like our the platform of implementation support initiatives. This is where we're tracking the implementation support from our partners. So the idea is really to reduce duplication of efforts so that everybody knows what's going on around the world on implementation support. So please reach out to us like uh, to have your initiative reflected in the platform if uh, it's not already there. There's a lot going on, so, so, so sometimes it's hard to follow up on everything. 
So if you missed anything, please let us know and we will be happy to include on the website. Uh, that said, like uh, one more, uh, another feedback that we heard like this, uh, it would be good to give like some highlights of everything that we're capturing on this tracker. So we will, uh, starting from these XF series, like we'll have like a couple of minutes to highlight the latest things that happened on uh, our XF partners in terms of uh, implementation support. So we have like a couple of feasibility studies that were concluded, recently concluded. So there was a very uh, robust uh, program like developed by the SEC and World Bank in Colombia. So which assessed the impact of, of palm oil sector on the production of SAF and renewable diesel. So uh, the so we have a positive outlook with potential compliance with Corsia emission reductions requirements. So we also uh, included there like a SAF feasibility study in Ireland that was developed by uh, SFS Sustainable Flight Solutions Ireland, uh, the ACTSAF partner, and it highlights like the economic benefits from the SAF industry development in Ireland and many other interesting outcomes. Uh, okay. So uh, we also had the conclusion of the SAF roadmap uh, for Australia. So what is developed by with the support from Boeing and uh, it builds consensus on, like on developing an Australian SAF industry. And finally, recently we had like the Singapore Sustainable Air Hub blueprint with, with a SAF target and levy implemented. So we have 1% SAF target growing to three to 5% by 2030. And, uh, and about events, like, so just yesterday we had the SAF Investor event that was concluded in London. So this event, like, covered, uh, tried to focus on the financing uh, aspects of uh, SAF production. So we're, and we're looking forward to hearing more of the outcomes of this. Like, we, this was very, very recent. So we also have, like, the UK Act SAF program that we briefly mentioned on our last event. And the UK will be uh, hosting these introductory training and SAF policy workshops in, in Africa. So here are the states and the dates, like, and we're working together with the UK to develop the materials for these trainings. And finally, we also have our partner Sustainable Vision Futures uh, that are developing like a series of congresses around the world that are also uh, outreaching the, and discussing SAF related aspects. So in February, we had the event uh, on the Middle East and North uh, Africa, so which was held in Dubai, and the next one in Amsterdam in May, and uh, and we'll have uh, and they will have also the North America and APEC region events in, later in the year. So all very exciting events, and I just read the outcomes from the MENA region. It's very exciting, like the discussions on CAF three outcomes and how to make things move in soft development on the region. So uh, about the SAF business case template and guide, like as Jane mentioned, we also referred to that in our first meeting. So we're currently starting to prepare uh, the uh, SAF feasibility study, uh, a, a template and guide for business case uh, development. So the idea is to detail key parameters in a SAF business case study and highlight approaches and assessments that may validate financial viability of a SAF project, for example, techno-economic assessments and sensitivity analysis, and explore impact on policies. So uh, as we mentioned before, again, like, so we are looking for support from all of you, uh, especially like uh, on reports that we could use as a reference to develop these, uh, this template and this guidance. And uh, when we get there, like we also will welcome support to develop the guidance and the template itself. So uh, here is the examples of possible references that we identified so far. And if you have any other thing, please let us know. Like, and just to highlight, we won't be uh, referencing the, the 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 material, like the the results of any material that is shared with us. We won't copy and paste the the results themselves. But what we're looking for here is really to take a look at the structure of the documents, the information that is, uh, the type of information that is contained on the reports, but not the information itself. So like, if there is anything like that you can share with us, but like is not publicly available, for example, we're happy to discuss how to uh, 
consider these uh, as a reference for uh, the development of the of these template and guidance. And finally, the feasibility studies. So uh, we will have, as Jane mentioned, we will have uh, many feasibility studies and business implementation projects coming in. So here is the list. And we're very close to uh, start the selection of the consultants that will develop these projects. We're on the final steps here, like to finalize the governance of all these projects here in ICAO. And, uh, and again, like uh, one more action for the XF partners. So contact us if you want to suggest any potential experts that with suitable expertise to develop these, uh, these uh, 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 studies. We have received already many suggestions. Thank you very much for that. We're starting coordinating with, with these potential consultants and just to assess like the, their expertise and the suitability. But if you have any, anything else in mind, please let us know and we will be happy to consider those suggestions. And finally, the, the, the XF series. So, uh, so today we're talking about green hydrogen. This is the current list of events that we're planning for the year. But as you know, like we are always subject to review uh, of this and feedback is welcome. And uh, please let us know if you want uh, anything to be covered in our next events. Uh, finally, uh, so before I hand over to the speakers from today, like I'll just make a quick introduction on the importance like on of this topic, like on green hydrogen for self-production in the context of Corsia. So, uh, so just to uh, really highlight like why we're talking about this, hydrogen is a key process input in the self-production pathways. So in, so for example, here, the HIFA process, which is like the main commercial process that we have today to produce CEF, it consists of various chemical uh, reaction mechanisms and hydrogen is required as an input in many of these, uh, these processes. So I, here it's how you will remember, if you don't remember how the HIFA process works, please come back to our previous events where we described it in very much detail. Our partners described that. But here, I just wanted to highlight that hydrogen is a very important input for the HIFA process. And also for the alcohol to jet, hydrogen is also a needed input in, in uh, one step of the, the conversion process. And why is that important for Corsia matters and for environmental matters in, in general, right? Like, so th this hydrogen production, so since it is part of the conversion process of the sustainable fuel, it is considered in the life cycle emissions of these fuels. So here are the tables like with the Corsia before life cycle emission values for Corsia eligible fuels produced with half a process and produced with ATJ. And the, the emissions associated with the hydrogen production, they are included in the core LCA value of the fuel. So what does it mean? Like if you reduce the emissions associated with the hydrogen, if you use clean hydrogen, for example, these values will be lower and the, the SAF will be better from an environmental and climate perspective. So now going to the fischer tropsch process, here the thing gets a bit more interesting because if uh, on the traditional fischer tropsch process, let's say, right, so which is based on uh, on biomass or on coal, there is no hydrogen input necessarily required for uh, to produce SAF. So because the hydrogen may come directly from the feedstocks themselves. So if we look here on the on the general process for the fischer tropsch pathway, there is not a need for an uh, in principle there is not a need for uh, a hydrogen input, but uh, however, like when the feedstock is CO two, so obviously there is no hydrogen coming from the feedstock, so because it is just the CO two. So in this case, yes, we need hydrogen as a as an input for the process. So and we're seeing a lot of these developments on power to liquid fuels, fuels uh, developed with direct uh, capture of CO two and CO2 waste streams. And these, uh, on these cases, hydrogen will be very important uh, input to the process as we'll hear from our speakers later today in very much detail. And of course, like these two processes, they can uh, exist in a single uh, fischer trop facility. And this is uh, something that we also hear later on, but I wanted to highlight this difference here up front 
so that we lay the, the, the basics like on the on why the, the green hydrogen is so important. And finally, like uh, again, highlighting that the, there are many ways to produce hydrogen. So the more uh, the traditional way to produce hydrogen is like how we call it like green hydrogen, and which is based on methane, uh, natural gas, or coal. And there is a chemical process to make hydrogen out of uh, methane, uh, natural gas, or coal. Uh, blue hydrogen is pretty much the same as green hydrogen, but with the cap carbon capture of the CO2 that is emitted on this process. So th this process of uh, generating hydrogen with natural gas, it generates CO2 by itself. So if you, ca if you capture this CO2 uh, that is generated uh, on the process, so this is what we call the blue hydrogen, which is better than green hydrogen from an environmental perspective. Uh, we also have like what we call the turquoise hydrogen, which is a new process. There is still not yet like uh, available commercially, but it will, may also be an improvement in terms of uh, life cycle emissions. And finally, the focus of our seminar today, which is green hydrogen, which is produced with electrolysis of water and renewable electricity. So uh, I want to highlight here, like the source of the CO2 and the renewable electricity is also very important when uh, on the production of uh, green hydrogen. So, and, and, and on the later production of CEF, right? So here is a table that we have on our IKO CEF rules of thumb. So I just wanted to highlight here, like if uh, you use grid electricity to produce green hydrogen, uh, there is no CO2 uh, improvement, right? Like according to the rules of thumb, because uh, the, uh, uh, this, I, this was based like on the US grid, United States grid, so and which is still based like uh, heavily based on fossil based uh, uh, fuels. So if you just use the grid electricity to produce the SAF, like there will be no uh, benefit on the final SAF produced. But there is a lot of benefit if it is produced with wind electricity or solar electricity. And similarly, there is also a difference in the life cycle emissions if with the use of direct air capture CO2 and waste CO2. So this information is on the SAF Rules of Thumb website. Probably you know, but if you don't, you if you just uh, search for it, you it's easily find. You can easily find it on our website. So uh, with that, uh, I would like to hand over like to our first speaker, uh, I, which is going to be uh, Luis Janeiro from Irina, which will give like Irina's perspective on SAF uh, from Glen Hydrogen. So uh, Luis, uh, are you there? Like, uh, so thank you very much for joining again and the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Bruno, and, and welcome everyone to this, uh, to this training. Uh, thanks Hikao colleagues for the kind invitation to Irina to, to this session. And uh, I, I see it's a very, very interesting mix of, of panelists. So very exciting topics to, to learn, uh, to learn from, from you. Um, so I, I was asked to talk to touch on cross-sectoral aspects of green hydrogen. That's that's what I will do. I will give a brief intro of Irina's views on the role of hydrogen in the green energy transition, the potential, uh, some key applications, costs, um, challenges, etc., and also some perspectives on where that green hydrogen could be potentially produced and, and implications for for trade. Um, can we go to first slide? So starting with a bit of context uh, for the discussion on the role of green hydrogen in the in the overall energy system transformation, here you see a breakdown of final energy consumption by energy carrier in the year 2020 and 2050, according to IRENA's uh, 1.5 scenario to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. As you see today, fossil fuels uh, dominate the, the picture. They account for roughly two thirds of final energy consumption and electricity accounts for roughly one uh, fifth. By 2050, this uh, landscape needs to uh, uh, completely change. Electricity becomes the main energy carrier, accounting for more than half of the final energy consumption. And this is driven mostly by decisive electrification of all forms of road transportation, as well as uh, a large fraction of heat demand in industry and, and buildings. And as you see in our scenario, hydrogen, and e-fuels produced from hydrogen account for about 14% of final energy consumption in such a 1.5 degree scenario. And the bulk of that hydrogen would come from uh, renewable power through electrolysis. 
So as you see, hydrogen's contribution is relatively modest in quantitative terms. It's important to take into account always that hydrogen is not an energy source, it's an energy carrier. And in general, hydrogen is a suboptimal substitute for most applications that are sold today with oil and gas. On the other hand, we see hydrogen as essential for some key applications, including the decarbonization of key industrial commodities like steel, the production of ammonia, and also in the transport sector, international transport sector in particular, uh, for shipping and aviation, which is the topic of today's, uh, today's meeting. Next slide, please. Even if we focus in those key applications where we see green hydrogen being the most valuable to the energy transition, we have ahead of ourselves a really serious challenge to scale production at the pace that we would need in such a scenario. First of all, it's important to understand that today, hydrogen is a major source of emissions, not a decarbonization vector. So today we produce roughly 100 million tons of hydrogen, mostly for fertilizer production and for refining and downstream chemicals. And almost all of that hydrogen is produced from fossil fuels with unabated uh, emissions. By 2050, this needs to change. Needs to, the production of hydrogen would need to scale fivefold, more than fivefold, while we make sure that most of that production is actually clean hydrogen. Just to give you a sense of the scale, just for the production of hydrogen and derivatives, we would need roughly as much electricity as we consume today for all purposes, so about 21,000 terawatt hours. And to produce that green hydrogen, we would need to scale electrolyzer production, so to have electrolyzer capacity, uh, three orders of magnitude uh, larger than today, from about one gigawatt today to 5,700 gigawatts. So I think this gives you a sense of the massive uh, scale of challenge that we have ahead of ourselves. Next slide, please. And precisely because that scaling hydrogen will be such a major challenge, we always advise policymakers and stakeholders to be extremely selective in prioritizing those applications of hydrogen where it adds the most value to the energy transition. Here you see some illustration. This is a dynamic picture, by the way, it changes with the developments of, of technology, but you see in some, some areas or some applications for which electrification has clear advantages. That's, for instance, low temperature heating buildings and industry, uh, light duty cars and trucks, even heavy duty trucks, as we see the technology uh, improvements. Then there's some, some gray area where uh, hydrogen can be in competition with electrification and uh, bioenergy. And then there's uh, a number of applications where hydrogen is uh, for sure needed. And those we call no regrets applications. Um, uh, some of them could be, for instance, the production of ammonia, as I mentioned earlier, the use in steel uh, production for primary steel production, and for the production of uh, SAF in, in aviation, as you, as you was mentioned earlier. Also, even for the production of hydrogen directly, in the case that uh, hydrogen aircraft could, could become commercially available in the future. Next slide, please. Now, uh, until now, I have talked mostly about the challenge. Now, I would like to bring some good news. The, the good news is that the cost of renewables is going down and is going down very, very fast. Uh, the cost of solar PV generation has declined by almost 90% over the last decade. The cost of wind onshore has declined by almost 70% in the last decade, and the cost of wind offshore has more than half, 60% reduction in the last decade. So solar and wind are now the cheapest options to produce power in most uh, markets around the world. And increasingly, we see that it's even cheaper to build a new solar plant than to continue operating an existing coal plant. So the, the, the total cost of a solar plant would be lower than the, just the marginal running cost of coal plants in an increasing number of circumstances. So we think that the world is now in a much better position to adopt renewable uh, technology. To do it at a, and to do it at a much faster pace than just a few years ago, to decarbonize power supply, to then decarbonize key applications through electrification, and yes, also to produce green hydrogen for those applications where electrification is not an option, like for instance, in the production of synthetic fuels or, or uh, SAF. Next slide, please. Another uh, a, a one key question is, uh, if green hydrogen can become competitive with uh, fossil-based hydrogen? And the answer 
is yes if 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 with a number of conditions if the deployment of renewable capacity and electrolyzer capacity happens at the pace and the scale that we need in a 1.5 scenario then we could see cost reductions that you see in this graph that are driven by technological learning economies of scale optimization as of supply chains as you see there's a big range of potential uh, cost of hydrogen depending on the electrolyzer cost and the and the electricity and the cost of electricity inputs in such a scenario of accelerated adoption of these technologies then we could see green hydrogen becoming in the area of competitiveness with fossil based uh, hydrogen as soon as in the later part of this decade but that would be in the best location uh, for renewables uh, generation and with certain assumptions of the cost of electrolyzer that you see that you see in this graph next slide please Another key question is where are those locations where we could produce green hydrogen? And to answer that question, we use GIS uh, modeling, combining a number of data sets, meteorological data, land eligibility criteria. So, for instance, we excluded protected areas, forests, areas with water stress, etc. And using some key technical parameters like the cost of capital, uh, capex, etc., to determine where uh, green hydrogen production is possible and at what cost. And you can see the result in this map from which we can extract a, a couple of insights. First insight is that as opposed to fossil fuels, renewables resource is very well distributed, as you see. With fossil fuels, the top five countries control roughly two thirds of the supply, both for oil and gas. And this is not the case uh, for renewables. And this will also have implications for the overall uh, trading volumes of, of, of hydrogen and also for the locations in which green hydrogen and derivatives like SAF can, um, can be produced. The second insight is that green hydrogen can reach very competitive levels in, in across a, a number of locations. You can see the cost of primary hydrogen production in the order of two US dollars per kilogram, um, in several locations, as I mentioned, and in this uh, optimistic scenario, which is the graph that we are showing here in, in 2050. When you add up all the potential that we see in this map, we uh, estimate the, the potential for production of green hydrogen at around 20 times, not the demand of hydrogen, but total energy system demand in 2050. So potential is not really the issue, but limitations in area availability. So for instance, there are a number of countries that by size, they cannot produce their own demand or that they can produce their own demand, but at higher cost. And therefore that could trigger the, the need or the interest in doing import or export with other jurisdictions. And this is, uh, if you go to the next slide, what we uh, try to analyze in a, in, a, in a study that we did last year, exploring how uh, hydrogen trade flows would play out in the future. So we ran an optimization model with a 2050 perspective, and you see the results in this map. Green flows represent green hydrogen, and blue represents ammonia produced from uh, green hydrogen. And we estimated in this analysis that about a quarter of the global hydrogen production, uh, uh, sorry, hydrogen demand could be traded uh, across borders. Now, to give a perspective of the size of this market, this is a quarter of the 14% of the energy system that I mentioned before that represented uh, that hydrogen uh, represented. So it's roughly 3% of the global final energy consumption. So it's a very significant market, but it's nowhere near the volume of uh, fossil fuels today. Now, of that hydrogen that would be traded uh, internationally, a bit more than half would travel within regions through pipelines. In, uh, mostly uh, concentrated in the European region and mostly using uh, retrofitted uh, natural gas pipelines or using those rights of way of those natural gas infrastructure to be used with pure hydrogen. And the other almost half, so 40%, 45%, would be shipped, but it would be shipped as you see the map with one in, in all those blue uh, flows, mostly as ammonia and to be used as ammonia. Uh, for fertilizers or potentially even for shipping fuel rather than to be reconverted uh, to uh, hydrogen. So we do not see significant volumes of hydrogen being shipped 
as hydrogen over C in this modeling exercise. So most hydrogen, uh, about three quarters of the global demand uh, would be produced and consumed uh, close to the demand centers. And this is a significant change from today's oil market where about three quarters is actually internationally traded, although it's a bit similar to today's gas market where about a third is uh, typically traded across borders. And I would like to conclude with a, let's say a final insight uh, from this analysis that also has implications for for the aviation uh, sector. It is important to consider that the physical characteristics of hydrogen make it technically difficult and economically costly to be traded uh, over, or let's say to be transported over long distances. So we think that the, the, the production of green hydrogen, so the, the, the exchange of uh, green hydrogen internationally would likely materialize to a great extent as uh, exchange in commodities produced with hydrogen rather than hydrogen itself. So we see trade of ammonia, we see trade of potentially iron or methanol, and of course also uh, synthetic fuels enabled by green hydrogen rather than trading hydrogen to then produce closer to consumption those, uh, those commodities. And this is because the transport cost of these commodities is much lower than the it's relatively small as a, as a fraction of the overall cost than the trade of hydrogen as an energy carrier. And this will obviously have implications for the production of stuff. So we see for instance one challenge is to find locations where you actually have the, the possibility to have uh, the cheap hydrogen through uh, high quality renewables resource. But at the same time, you have in that same location or geographically close, a uh, renewable source of carbon to actually produce those those um, those either biofuels or synthetic fuels. So this, this is something that we are uh, exploring further in our current analysis, and we will be uh, very happy to cooperate with some of you in understanding this this better in the future. And with this, I I conclude our introduction and looking forward to hear the, the next presentation. Thank you very much again for the invitation. To you. Thank you very much, Luiz. Yeah, that was a great overview, like, and very good, good news, like, that things are moving very fast, and uh, we hope to see, like, a lot of these uh, green hydrogen uh, projects and the volumes being uh, uh, being uh, implemented on the market very soon. And in line with that, like, this is what we will start hearing from uh, from our next speakers, like, so we'll now move to, to Soren Mikkelsen and Matthias Madsen from Topso who you explain like the topsoil initiatives and explain how green hydrogen is produced and what's the role of green hydrogen in the production of SAF and e fuels. So, uh, sorry, Matthias, I don't know who's going to start, but uh, the, the floor is yours. Yeah. Thank you, Bruno, and thank you for the opportunity for Topso to contribute to this training. If you could move to the next slide, please, then we would like to start by showing an overview of, of the, the most commercially relevant ASTM pathways of today, uh, relevant for SAF. And as it was said previously in this talk, then hydrogen is important for all the pathways. Of course, in e-fuels, it is the main energy feedstock, but it's also important in the other pathways. And if if we just start from HEFA SPK, which is the only commercially operated technology today, then of course it is feedstock limited, but we also see that there's a potential to grow the feedstock base, for example, by, by growing intermediate crops. Um, Topso currently does not offer the alcohol to jet pathway, but if you look at the FT uh, pathway, then we think there could be benefits of combining uh, the gasification and the e-fuels pathway to achieve scale, but also to improve carbon efficiency um, of the gasification pathway. In gasification, you, you produce a syngas and to fully utilize that carbon uh, in your original feedstock, there could be a benefit of adding green hydrogen to that process. But if we, if we move to the next slide, then we can focus on, on the e-fuels pathway. So green hydrogen and, and CO2 as feedstocks. And for this pathway, Topso offers a solution together with Sasol that's fully integrated. And I just want to highlight here that this was also shown in one of the previous slides and there was a mistake uh, showing uh, the reverse water gas shift as FT reactor. And, and this is not correct. Uh, first, you need to do reverse water gas shift, then you do Fischer-Tropsch, 
and finally hydro processing to produce your final fuel. And this solution offers uh, very high selectivity to SAF, um, but it also offers flexibility to switch between jet fuel and diesel and nafta. Um, but one of the key features is that by having an electrified reactor for reverse water gas shift, you are really able to utilize most of your costly green hydrogen uh, to your final product. So if you compare uh, electrified reverse water gas shift with traditional reverse water gas shift, then it offers much higher uh, hydrogen utilization. Finally, if you, if you can move two steps ahead, I think we can share one detail in this uh, because you actually have um, low pressure steam generated in FT and that can be recycled back to electrolysis. And Cern will talk more about this, but it's something that you really can utilize in high temperature electrolysis to increase the overall efficiency even further. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, there it was. Uh, so this is just to show the basic chemistry of the FT pathway. So as I said, first you need to uh, do reverse water gas shift to convert CO2 and hydrogen into a syngas consisting of CO and hydrogen, which is then fed to fissure troughs, where you form a, a variety of hydrocarbons. You get a certain distribution and, and some of those hydrocarbons will be too long hydrocarbons for jet fuel. And that's why you need to do hydrocracking to get them into the fine, to the jet fuel boiling range. Um, but this is just to show you what role hydrogen plays in this pathway. And CERN will, will explain more about electrolysis and how to produce green hydrogen for SAF. Yeah, thank you very much, Matthias. And yeah, and as is very evident from this slide, you need to have green hydrogen produced uh, hopefully by uh, renewable energy fed to an electrolyzer to have a sustainable production of sustainable aviation fuel. And maybe I can say that uh, Matthias and I are both sitting in Denmark in the, at the top of uh, Copenhagen headquarters. So if you go to the next slide, then this is how it looks like as a very schematized uh, for how you produce uh, green hydrogen based on high temperature solid oxide and trolls cell uh, technology. And that technology is something that Topso has in its portfolio. What Matthias showed is that if you have steam available uh, for this production of green hydrogen, then you can actually increase the efficiency because Topso's is we see electrolysis section is the so-called high temperature electrolysis. So the electrolysis reaction is conducted at around 750 degrees steam. But that compared to compared to uh, other uh, technologies, temperature, uh, then um, uh, then the top source of high temperature electrolysis is, is running at 750 degrees C, and that means that you're running on steam, which means if you have steam available, then you can actually benefit from that, put it in, because you need to have steam in the water evaporated before it goes into the electrolysis section. Within the electrolysis section, you're then producing the green hydrogen. Then when the uh, leaf, the, when this uh, green hydrogen is, is leaving the trellis section within the coal, then you cool it and you need to uh, separate it. And then you have the green hydrogen that you can use for different purposes. Here, it is shown that this electrolysis is being uh, fed and being heated up by use of renewable energy. But of course, electrolysis can be uh, powered by also fossil-based uh, energy. But of course, in order to make it sustainable, we focus on green uh, electrons being generated by renewable energy sources. Can we go to the next slide? Yeah. In general, we say there are three different ways of producing uh, green hydrogen out of electrolysis. Alkaline PEP, they are referred to as low, low temperature electrolysis because it's running around 70 to 90 degrees C. Whereas the SOEC solid oxide electrolysis cell is running at 750 degrees C. Therefore, you also differentiate between liquid electrolysis as low temperature and steam electrolysis as high temperature. In uh, PEP, then it's called also, it's an abbreviation for proton exchange membrane. 
So what is happening is that you take uh, the water and then you are actually transferring a proton a hydrogen atom across the electrolytes, hence the name uh, proton exchange membrane. Then you generate your hydrogen. In alkaline, you take water and then you take a hy uh, hydroxide ion and you transfer that to the uh, electrolyte and then you create your uh, hydrogen. Whereas in SOEC, you actually take an oxide ion uh, and then um, you are transferring that to the uh, membrane in order to produce your uh, in order to produce your green uh, hydrogen. So, if you can have the next slide, please. So, based on simple on it's not simple, but based on thermodynamic electrochemical chemical thermodynamics, then it's not something we are saying because top two is. Uh, Using SOEC is simply as it is based on thermochemistry that SOEC has the highest efficiency of all the electrolyzers. That will also be, be, will be said if you go to a presentation by a, a technology supplier of uh, alkaline or PET. And with you, if you have heat integration as you have in this downstream process that you see you have sensors, this gas to liquid, then the SOEC is 30% more efficient than alkaline or PET. And that is significant because in the process of producing uh, sustainable aviation fuel by use of green hydrogen that you have obtained by electrolysis, then up to 80 to 90 percent of the electricity consumed goes into the production of the green hydrogen in the electrolyzer. Therefore, it is very important to have a high efficiency uh, electrolyzer. So, next, uh, yeah. The good thing about SOEC compared to especially PEP is that it consists of materials that are abundant in nature and therefore they can easily be scaled up without material availability constraints. This is very important also, you know, when you talk about sustainability, of course, in the production of, of a sustainable fuel, then you also need to talk about sustainability in terms of circular uh, economy and reusability. And then the last uh, bullet here is that compared to uh, low temperature electrolysis then uh, high temperature electrolysis SOEC is also capable of mobilizing CO2 which is a very very stable molecule and that comes with some benefits because do you see more and more applications where you actually want to have a biogenic CO2 source that is directly converted to CO in, in different sectors and then there is also this which is very uh, interesting with SOEC is that since SOEC is capable of electrolyzing and mobilizing water, uh, H2O, and CO2 at the same time, then you can actually co electrolyze it. So you can elect elect electrolyze both these molecules at the same time, and then you will be able to produce hydrogen and CO, which is essentially synthesis gas, which essentially also can go into the fissure drops route. But this is something that is currently under development. Now the focus is on uh, steam electrolysis independently and CO2 electrolysis, but we see a lot of interesting uh, aspects for us to continue developing on. Next slide. Yeah, this is a very important uh, slide because there are a lot, a lot of focus on green hydrogen production and there are many new players to the market, but with this we are very proud to say Electrolysis and development of electrolysis processes and optimization of electrolysis processes is not something that at all is new to Topsu, because we have been doing that since the 1980s. However, in the 1980s, the focus was on fuel cells globally. And a fuel cell is where you have your hydrogen, you put it into a fuel cell, then you produce your uh, renewable or you produce your electricity. But then there was a global shift in the market, and in 2013, it was evident that it was shifted towards SOEC. In SOEC, then you have your energy and you want to produce your height. And the good thing about SOEC and SOFC is it, it's exactly the reverse process. So if we have developed SOFC, solid oxide fuel cell, in the 1980s, then you, you could easily just reverse the process, use the same cell, and then you will be able to produce your hydrogen out of renewable electricity. So therefore, 
We started to make demonstration units and put it into industrial scale in several running references globally. In order for our board of directors in September 2022 to take FID on the biggest SOEC manufacturing facility that is now under construction here in Denmark, 200 kilometers from our problem I sitting, we have the breaking ground and we are on target to produce the first 100 megawatt of SOEC uh, stacks that will be delivered to our launch clients first ammonia in the start of next year. Uh, and that's the uh, capacity of that factory can be gradually uh, ramped up to 1.2 gigawatts annually. And I can also say that this factory has been recognized by the EU Innovation Fund in Europe and has been granted a significant contribution of 94 billion euro in December last year. So that was our early Christmas gift. Uh, and I hope with that, normally I give this uh, introduction to uh, green hydrogen production by SOEC in an hour or so. And now I have I hope I have managed to do it sufficiently in these 10 minutes. So if there's any questions uh, down the line, please feel free to connect me on LinkedIn and uh, yeah, I will be glad to answer. I don't think I have more slides now. Thank you very much, Sorry, No, yeah, this is great to hear like how the technology works in detail, like, and uh, yeah, this is exactly what we are expecting on this series, like to really go into a, a a higher uh, depth like on the technologies and very exciting to hear all these new uh, technologies coming from top so so like with that like i think it's also a good link to our next speaker like which uh, will illustrate like how to go from the technology to the uh, real uh, re-implementation of a project so now so i'd like to invite alexander mozabet which is the uh, structure market referent at the qr energy that you describe like the ongoing development of a project to build uh, green hydrogen and e-fuels production facility. So, Alexandria, are you there? Yeah. Okay, no. so the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, first of all, thank you for allowing us to present care activity and share our experience on hydrogen project development. So, QR is an independent power producer of 650 collaborators and present in 20 countries. Uh, and we started six years ago to participate to the eclosion of the hydrogen market for several reasons. Um, may I ask you to go to the next slide, please? Um, okay, perfect. So um, as I said, we started to participate to the eclosion of the hydrogen market for several reasons. The first one was to solve the issue of the intermittency of uh, our renewable assets uh, as a way to store our green electron. Uh, also to ensure an indirect use uh, on green electron and in our two bed sectors was the maritime and also of course the aviation and for us also it was a new way to be closer from from our customer in order to sell our product so in that sense we are currently thinking of all the hydrogen, hydrogen derivatives that will allow us to transport from um, our production site to the customer um, to um, uh, maybe ev everywhere in the world, but mostly in Europe. And in that sense, uh, we are thinking that uh, the whole hydrogen chain uh, from ammonia to liquid hydrogen, and of course, from, of sustainable aviation fuel with the ESAF. And to do so, uh, we want to create uh, uh, projects in promising geographies, um, uh, mostly in Brazil and Iceland, but firstly in France. And we fix uh, ambitious targets that you can see in the slide, um, which would be uh, by 2032 to produce at least uh, 1 million tons uh, of green hydrogen per year. Um, so now we present to the, our most of our projects regarding uh, ISAF on the next slide. So um, this project um, uh, is called ILAN, and it will allow us to have uh, uh, first experiences uh, on the ESAF project. So currently we already have one uh, hydrogen project that is under construction and that should be launched at the early stage of 2025 and would be in the on, in first phase of 20 megawatts and 50 megawatts in seven phase. So we already have uh, sort of knowledge uh, regarding the hydrogen production and we want to uh, get benefit from that to uh, create now a more, more bigger projects uh, and project on ESAF. So um, this is the, the case for Ilan. So it's one of our, our most mature projects in development. Um, it's located in, in Lannemezan in the south of France and 
it will be entirely dedicated to the production of ISAF. So organizing this project, we already uh, secured the land, uh, secured the electricity supply, and us QA will be in charge of the renewable uh, energy production and green hydrogen production. So this project, uh, which is under development since 2021, uh, should start to operate in 2029 if everything is going good. But we will see that the project development of the project may might face several barriers uh, all along its development uh, to its launch. So please go to the next slide. So um, yeah, indeed, there is four main requirements that need to be complete if we want to think about making a project project in a certain location. So first of all, the green hydrogen. Uh, uh, require uh, uh, water and electricity, uh, uh, as we already saw. So regarding electricity for a project like Ilan, uh, we will need to secure at least 2.7 terawatt uh, per year of renewable and low carbon electricity, which is uh, equivalent to uh, 2 gigawatt of solar uh, PV installed in the south of France. And regarding water, we will need to secure at least 600,000 uh, cubic meter of water per year uh, for always like a, a project like Ilan. Uh, so do those important quantities might represent the major stakes uh, in location uh, prone to drought and might face uh, water scarcity issues. So uh, the, accept the acceptability of the project can be questioned particularly on this point. Also, those, those projects need a lot of space uh, as we plan to create an important uh, industry. Uh, thus, we need to secure the land. Uh, in the case of France, uh, it's pretty complicated. As you may know, we have, uh, we have a new regulation, which is called the Loisanne, which restricts the use of new land uh, for industrial purpose. So this new law creates uh, land scarcity and competition among new projects of all types. So it's quite a major step for us uh, in our project development. And the last but not the least, we need to secure the offtake. Uh, indeed, uh, the projects are very expensive and we cannot be fully equity based. So we need to prove to investors or, or banks that our product will find a client um, at the start of the operation. Uh, but uh, as you may know, it's not that easy as market is quite new, but um, in, in Europe, thanks to the new regulation with REFU, uh, it gives clear insight and clear ambition for development of, of its market. And it allows to, to build strong relation with, with, with some actor of the field. Of the field. So may I ask you to go to the next slide? Um, so now when we have seen some those main components, uh, we can go deep deeper in, in the advertisement stage uh, and we can pursue the project development in uh, order to concretize the project. So at this stage of the project, we will need to build uh, a consortium of actors around our project in order to share the project risk. Uh, indeed, as care, we will be directly involved in the project development uh, as we will furnish the green electricity and green hydrogen to the project for the production of ESAF. But uh, we still need to find other parties that are experts uh, on the other part of the project that has the expertise on the engineering, uh, on the supply chain of the e-fuel, because this is way something that we uh, are not expert in. We, we need to uh, uh, each of us share our knowledge on the field, but to to uh, to do the project. So as this market is quite new and numerous actors have valuable expertise uh, that need to be enhanced, um, we will really need to believe in the consortium idea that we really want to, to pursue on. Uh, also, we believe that to ensure the progression of hydrogen technology, we know uh, we need to, um, to, to uh, fulfill the economic disparity between the first fossil fuel and the renewable-based fuel uh, thanks to maybe subsidies or new investments. And in that sense, we believe uh, that each governmental action uh, need to be in line with the, with the market. Um, that's why uh, the project needs to be in line with governmental action, uh, apply for subsidies, and uh, which become uh, an essential component of the project. And indeed, uh, in the context, the governmental support is essential for the launch of, of the project. So just to conclude on this part, uh, we know that uh, only 1% of hydrogen pro production projects have yet finalized the FID. Uh, just this fact show that the current state of difficulty of the project uh, management, management uh, is something uh, that is a, a major stake in the field and that uh, secure all the components to really make the project is something that is 
not that easy and need to be understand from 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 the field so yeah thank you thank you very much alexander so they yeah, very nice insights like and uh, and again like uh this importance of the government support and we'll hear there like from the speakers that will come on the later uh, later on the session here but very exciting like and congratulations for the initiative like and we hope like it goes it continues to evolve like uh as you're uh, as you're describing here thank you very much for thank the you. presentation so now, like, uh, we'd like to move to our next speaker. Like, so we we hear the manufacturer perspective. So we hear like uh, from Nicola Landry, hydrogen infrastructure development at, at Airbus, who explain like the vision for development of a green hydrogen ecosystem. So Nicolas, uh, the floor is yours. Can, can you hear us? Yes. Uh, yes. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, yes, uh, let me uh, give you a view from uh, from an aircraft manufacturer perspective from Airbus on uh, the development of green hydrogen. Um, next uh, slide, please. So, of course, green hydrogen, that's a relatively new topic for an aircraft manufacturer, right? Uh, this is not something we've had to look at uh, in the past decades. Uh, it's now growing in importance, and this mainly from two perspectives. The first one, of course, is the importance of hydrogen in the manufacture of uh, synthetic uh, SAF, as you just heard from the previous presentations. So uh, this, uh, so of course, uh, an aircraft manufacturer like Airbus does not manufacture SAF, but we want to do all we can to uh, promote the development of SAF. This is a major pillar of decarbonation and uh, for reaching the, the net zero ambitions of the air transport industry. So the development of a green hydrogen ecosystem to support the production of PTL and synthetic SAF is absolutely crucial. So this is something that we have to, to look at and to uh, see how we can support in any possible way. The second perspective, which was briefly mentioned at the beginning, is the possibility to use hydrogen itself as a fuel in an aircraft. A number of uh, aircraft manufacturers are looking at this option. Uh, there are some uh, prototypes already uh, flight testing uh, hydrogen technologies. This is also really important. Uh, this is something that needs to be investigated and see what is the potential of hydrogen as a fuel in an aircraft. Uh, of course, uh, there are uh, uncertainties in the coming 10, 20 years on uh, the availability of uh, SAF, of its costs, of the, of the regulatory framework, of societal expectations, etc. So we really have to uh, look at all our options uh, and study everything that is available on the table. So as indicated on this slide, uh, hydrogen used uh, directly as a fuel has, of course, the, the potential to, uh, to reach an excellent level of decarbonation. Assuming uh, hydrogen is produced in a green way, as, one, as was mentioned previously, for, for example, through uh, renewable energy, then uh, the CO2 footprint of uh, flying on hydrogen is excellent and also uh, has uh, the, the benefit of the potential benefit of reducing non CO2 e effects. In both cases, uh, be it for SAF or for direct use, we have the benefit with hydrogen that uh, we are not alone. Uh, a lot of industrial sectors are looking at hydrogen for all kinds of applications. So we do account that uh, in the coming years and decades, uh, the production will increase, the regulatory framework will improve, and costs for producing large amounts of green hydrogen will decline. Uh, this is absolutely crucial to uh, enable an economic viability, both of uh, SAF and uh, direct use of hydrogen on board aircraft. Uh, so as you can see, we are uh, working uh, actively at understanding the hydrogen ecosystem, at understanding the various potential uses of hydrogen in aviation, uh, and how we can support that. On the next slide, uh, you will see that the two uh, kinds of usage that I mentioned for hydrogen in aviation, so direct use on board aircraft or uh, as a derivative through SAF, have a number of synergies. And that is, of course, uh, on, on the left, the production, the initial production of hydrogen uh, and the related uh, supply of electricity, of, of uh, initial energy. 
these, uh, this is really a common topic for uh, direct use of hydrogen or SAF production. We need uh, the uh, green hydrogen to be produced in large quantities at low costs. So this is what absolutely needs to be pushed and it will benefit uh, the, the rest of uh, the supply chain. On the bottom, so you heard already in previous presentations, the uh, manufacturing process for synthetic fuel based on green hydrogen. On top, you see the other possibility, which is to use hydrogen on board an aircraft, most likely in liquid form. Here, the supply chain is different. The infrastructure implications are different. The operational aspects are different. And there's a number of topics to, to work on to make this new supply chain possible. But there are clear synergies at the origin of these chains, uh, which are really important and, we, and which explain why we want to uh, look at hydrogen in detail. So how do we make this possi <clears throat> possible? Uh, on the next slide, please. <clears throat> You'll see that uh, this is far from simple. Uh, we, we as, uh, as an aircraft manufacturer, are talking to a lot of stakeholders to uh, support the best, uh, the best we can, the development of a green hydrogen ecosystem for aviation. It's important to precise for aviation. There is a lot of talk around hydrogen. There is a lot of funding available. There is a lot of projects uh, in all regions of the world for hydrogen, but very few stakeholders have aviation on their radar. Uh, it's starting to happen for synthetic fuel. It's not yet really there for the direct use of uh, hydrogen as a fuel in aircraft. So there is a lot of advocacy, of explanation to do to uh, put aviation on the radar of hydrogen policies. So as you can see here on, uh, on this uh, very, very simple uh, slide, <clears throat> is that we have to push that to uh, the full chain of stakeholders uh, involved in the manufacture of hydrogen, in the transport uh, and related infrastructure, and in the world of aviation. So that includes, uh, uh, of course, at the end of the chain, uh, airports and airlines. Uh, that includes, at the beginning of the chain, Energy providers, uh, we at our level are in uh, discussion with uh, many energy providers in all uh, regions in the world to understand their plans, to explain our, our future needs, to also uh, understand the carbon, food, carbon footprint of the various options available. Uh, we need to talk to uh, uh, funds, to uh, investors, to financial institutions to make sure that uh, sufficient funding is available for, for this development. Uh, there are all kinds of initiatives around hydrogen. We are mentioning here uh, uh, hydrogen alliances that exist in, uh, in Europe, in North America, in Asia, in, in many uh, parts of the world. Again, to make sure that they take aviation into account. We have to look at synergies with other sectors, the shipping sector, the industrial sectors, etc. Many branches of, uh, of industry and of energy are looking at hydrogen, have projects for hydrogen. Let's see how we can uh, leverage all these initiatives to also address uh, parts of the needs for aviation. Of course, uh, the uh, exchange with uh, institutions, regulatory bodies, governments is key. This is what drives everything else. With appropriate policies in place, with an appropriate framework, we can make it work. We can have uh, policies which will make uh, the development of green hydrogen uh, possible, which will make uh, large-scale development of SAF uh, e economically viable, and which may also make in the future uh, the, um, the development of hydrogen-powered aircraft commercially viable. So uh, the, this regulatory framework, these uh, supporting policies and governmental strategies are absolutely key, and uh, we are active on um, it's important for all aircraft manufacturers to be active on, uh, on all these fronts. Uh, and of course, a very important aspect is also the backing of research institutes and academia. There is a number of aspects which are still open uh, 
uh, when it comes to uh, the impact of uh, hydrogen in aviation. Uh, the uh, effect of contrails, be it uh, with SAF or with pure hydrogen. Uh, the end-to-end -end, uh, carbon footprint and the uh, life cycle impact of these products, etc. There is still a number of topics that needs to be researched that are currently being researched and uh, where aircraft manufacturers also have to provide their support, uh, their testing means, uh, their own knowledge to make sure that we, as fast as possible, are able to fully understand these impacts and address uh, concerns uh, around this. <coughs> voilà. So, <coughs> sorry. Uh, so, uh, th this gives you uh, an overview of why uh, aircraft manufacturers are also involved in uh, the development of this green hydrogen ecosystem uh, why we will uh, why we need to uh, be increasingly involved in this to have a full understanding of this uh, supply chain which is really new to us and how we can engage in that uh, this uh, strategy to form to be part of this global ecosystem is really important and again i'd like to stress it uh, the importance of putting aviation on the radar of hydrogen policies is really important. It is, uh, it is not yet at the required level uh, in our point of view. So we'll continue uh, working on that with the whole community. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nicolas. Like, yeah, very interesting to hear like all the challenges that uh, we will need to face like to to develop this new industry like and and to direct these uh the, the the new the green hydrogen to aviation right like so thank you very much for these insights and also congratulations on the many initiatives from airbus on on hydrogen like including the development of aircraft like that we are looking forward to see it flying like in the in the future yeah so uh with that like i uh i think we're we're now uh, in a good position to to change to our iq member states that will be able to talk about what uh, they're doing in terms of policy to make all this happen, right, in practice. So I'm happy then to invite uh, Luis Ignacio Castillo, coordinator of the Green Hydrogen Area in the Agencia de Sustainabilidad Energetica of Chile. So we will talk about uh, Chile's initiatives uh, to support uh, green hydrogen industry. So uh, Luis, so the floor is yours. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you very much. Well, for... well uh, hi, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, um, thank you to the organization and uh, we are the, the colleagues to previous presentations. Uh, I will show you a brief design um, strategies of Chile in SAFs, and then uh, I will talk about the policies in green hydrogen. Um that next, next next slide please. Well, to begin, uh, I would like to introduce to the Chill SAF Roadmap 2050 that is about to be launched in the conference wins in Change America in April this year. Uh, to contract this document, which was in Chile in October 2022 with a seminar, a number of meetings of systems that form part of SAP Roundtable were held. Uh, in this meeting, 35 institutions present their points of view of the deployment of SAF in Chile, the ones in the slide. And further, we gathered information from more than 60 institutions that are part of the field value chain. I would like to highlight the money of the presenters of from institutions that belong to the Chilean hydrogen industry. Um, with that input, we start building SAF Roadmap, a document that went to a public consultation process, again, gathering opinion opinions and points of view. The product is the document that will be starting point of deployment of SAF in Chile and has strong hydrogen input at its understood Chile, Chilean policies that aim to boost the hydrogen industry. Um, as you see, uh, all the ecosystem of hydrogen and, and airplanes are in this, in this process. Um, and if you have Many questions or any questions regarding to the SAF roadmap, feel free to write to my colleague uh, to email and input on, on the chat, Fernanda Cabanas. Um, next slide, please. Well, the context of the green hydrogen in Chile uh, have two principal uh, guidelines or policies. The, the one is the, the National Strategy of Green Hydrogen 
launched in 2020 that um that let's say or or that was the the first movement to the macro um ideas or the macro guidelines to the hydrogen presenting the hydrogen to the industry and the country and the and the citizens and the second stage we have the green hydrogen roadmap that it's a um, short and medium place a uh, medium um um, time policy and the main objective is define the roadmap between 2023 and 2030 30, 30, that allows to deployment the sustainable ind industry of green hydrogen and its derivative principle ammonia and methane and the specific ob objectives uh, are sustainability coordination identify, identify new actions and define roles roles understanding in the public and the private um, ecosystem. Next slide. Well, the main process or, or the macro process that is the, the, was developed through a participatory process that include four levels. One, citizens in the citizens workshops. Two, the interministerial tables that was the main focus of this um, design because uh, it is the core to to make um, or, or the feedback be between the other levels. The three is Green Hydrogen Advisory Council. Is the the consult consultative council that was formed by public um, privacy actors uh, and private actors. And the four is the strategic, strategic committee that was composed by politics and and and, and economic in actors that have a lot of experience making industry and making policies in others uh, sectors, um, for example, energy or or mining. <clears throat> Then um, the, 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 the intermediate, as we say, uh, take the central role, coordinating to design the plans, initiatives, providing topics and inputs for discussion, and in another instance of participation and taking the results and said instance for uh, their own job. This process um, was developed in, in one year. And Recently, we have the public consultation, and that's the final input to launch the final uh, roadmap of of green hydrogen. And the process, um, in personal, I think that is is very successful because they take all the ecosystem of the hydrogen in in, in understanding this, the the citizens' participation, the technical participation, and the political participation, and we have a lot of um, lessons and and we have more experience to make policies in the future. Next slide, please. Well, the principal roadmap option uh, are are represented in the lines of action of the um, the roadmap. The first one is governance that implies all the um, roles taken by the, the the politics and the and the private sector and we have two two lines of action in this topic the second one is the market enabling and promotion that as you can see is the most um is the is the, is the topic with more actions and these are focused in the the fermentation of the demand the 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 local demand and the uh, promote the promotion and, and preparatives for the um, the future or, or or to to the second wave that is exportation and, and international production enabling infrastructure is a really important uh, topic because uh, we have to prepare to prepare all the chain of value of the hydrogen it's meaning it is like to the the, the the logistic sector um participation training and education is more focused on the citizen a uh, permission system is really important because they can incentive more um, inversion in the future and local and, and inter international industry sustainability 
it is really important because this the the the, the permit the, the permits uh, on the future and we have a more uh, more structures to make the industry more sustainability the retailers deployment that is a really important thing uh, in in our country uh, development of capacities and low, low knowledge and skills is related to education to to the citizens and international positioning that uh, it's in line with previous presentation and the efforts of the government to promote this this industry <clears throat> next slide please well in in a brief uh, resume we have the the line the, the timeline of the 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 policies and the action of, of this uh, roadmap uh, as I can say, the 2020 Chile launched the um, the green the national hydrogen strategy, and in the 2023, in between 2023 and 2026, we have the and but the investment signals, regulations, and uptakers. This is the focus of the the roadmap. And uh, I, I I the highlight that I put is the uh, energy efficiency cost. We have uh, Chile have a a really um, competitive um, prices of energy, principally for the sun in the north of the country and the, the wind in the, in the south. That, is, that implies a, um, a competitive um, levelized, levelized cost of hydrogen, but uh, the, 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 the electrical system needs to be more robust in transmission and other issues now. If you send the permit system, that I say is really important driver to to make uh, invest to the investors to 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 make deals. Tax and financial incentives. Um, Chile have a the are designing the first uh, facility, financial facility of hydrogen by Corfo with investors that like. Uh, in others, and uh, Chile uh, wants to have more investors, private or or, the, or multilateral organizations. A uh, local demand is a really important driver because permits to to the country make more industry um, have more lessons and um, prepare to the uh, to the future with exportations of hydrogen. Define environmental, social standards on working working conditions. This is a really important topic in the in the Chilean context because all the all the projects need this this point of view to 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 have the permissions and uh, in the in the investment sector is a is a driver that is 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 demanded to to finance no. And the second window is the productivity chain and decarbonization. Uh, and I have these points uh, that I, I highlight. First is the regulation implement contribution to decarbonization. Oh, no, sorry, the, the, the regulation implemented that implies that all the, um, the rules that make clear and the regulation that it's, it, it was developed in the first window finally have a solid um, implementation in the in the regulatory system now a contribution to decarbonization that implies more projects and that impacts to decarbonize the, the energy matrix and the the use of um, carbon in the in the different sectors the other point important is the formation of human capital because um, we need this to to make the industry, and finally the productive chain and local development uh, that that I mentioned is really important to to make this um, industry possible. I I have full disponibility. Dispon I thank you very much, Luis. Like uh, they're very exciting to hear, like uh, how Chile is moving towards uh, this uh, new industry and how it's, it is supporting and putting all the stakeholders together, right? Like this is something we hear throughout the importance of putting all the various stakeholders uh, together towards like the same objective. 
uh, congratulations on the initiatives and uh, I'm sure it's going to be a good example like for other Akin member states that are thinking on uh, pursuing this, uh, this option. So, and with that, like I'd like to come to our last speaker, like again, to bring the perspective of another state. So we have AJ O'Hira, which is a strategic architect for fuel cell and hydrogen at Nido, Japan. We will also present like latest initiatives to implement a safe uh, 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 green hydrogen in, in industry in Japan. So AJ, thank you very much for joining. Like I know it's very late there in, for, for you now. I really appreciate your time and your willingness to share your experiences with us now. So can you hear us there? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you very oh, much. Good, good. So, good, good. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you, thank you, Bruno. Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. I'm really happy to be here to introduce Japan's activity, Japan's effort to, to, to promote hydrogen. Okay, next, please. Uh, yeah, hydrogen is uh, not not new uh, to Japan. You know, uh, our first and the national R and D project on the hydrogen was established uh, almost a half century ago. But and after a long period of the research and development on the hydrogen, we are able to move from the uh, technology demonstration uh, to the social implementation. But and uh, <clears throat> with a strong the political commitment, and uh, Japan has strongly uh, promoted hydrogen in uh, less than 10, 10 years. Well, um, <clears throat> there uh, this slide show the current Japan policy move. The, uh, Japan's most uh, economy toward the industry and that's the leading in the hydrogen policy. They developed the hydrogen roadmap in 2014, 10 years ago. In the 2017, uh, Japan's uh, minister government has set the world first national hydrogen strategies. We are welcomed over this century over the 40 country uh, developed the national and hydrogen strategy, but then uh, Japan's a pioneer at this kind of their activity. In the 2020, and uh, Japan's prime minister um, declared the carbon neutrality, well, like uh, as a as a country. Well, and uh, according to the Japan prime minister's declaration, carbon neutrality, uh, we set the several well and uh, policy initiative to promote some kind of green technology. All right, and uh, <clears throat> for uh, for the hydrogen. And based on the uh, our previous basic hydrogen strategy, we set uh, several in uh, the targets that uh, I know I would like you to pick up the, the point about the target. One is and uh, the supply demand volume on the hydrogen. Well, now currently and uh, we are current in uh, Japan the hydrogen demand in two million tons. We make it three million tons in 2030, and the 20 million ton is 10 times bigger than, than the current level in the 2050s. When the uh, hydrogen costs one of the key issues. Well, there are many barriers in the hydrogen cost, but you know, uh, when the target for the hydrogen cost at port, it's meaning hydrogen, including the hydrogen production and uh, uh, transfer to the hydrogen carrier to the import of the hydro hydrogen as port, Japan port, which is on the three, um, the 30, sorry, and the 30 Japanese end for normal cubic meter in the 2030, and less than the 20, uh, Jap two, uh, 20 Japanese end for normal cubic meter by 20, 2050. That's kind of a and the challenging target. The next one. Well, this was a slide show on uh, Japan's new hydrogen strategies. When uh, after the uh, six years and uh, uh, Japan's government uh, decided to, to, to revise on uh, Japan's hydrogen strategies. And uh, so it's uh, including the sort of new target uh, for the uh, uh, installation of the <coughs> electrolysis electrolyzer. And according to the IEA forecast on several years ago, the scale of the water electrolysis installation will reach in 550 gigawatt in, in 2030. And so uh, Japan target would get some kind of 10% of the uh, global market with electrolysis in, in 10 years. But and not, not only in, in Japan, but also in the global market. Um, <clears throat> And, and as the most important thing is in uh, Japan's promoting the low carbon hydrogen, we're we uh, considering about the carbon intensity, carbon footprint that's a, a criteria, and we didn't care about the uh, color of the hydrogen. But, but we also recognize the importance of the green hydrogen, but and we promote the not only green hydrogen, also the, but also the uh, uh, blue hydrogen. Well, we, we need to, to develop the uh, kind of the hydrogen demand there are several types of hydrogen demand. When the first one is the power generation, we um, 
communicate with the Japan State Board like a for a, for a company. And uh, we uh, finally we get the commitment for the Japan that the power company to use the hydrogen for power generation, and the fuel cell is a good key device that you should uh, to using the utilizing the hydrogen. And Toyota Honda already published the uh, uh, launch the fuel cell fuel cell vehicle. Them they expand their activity not only in passenger vehicle like the other than the commercial vehicles. For industrial uses, uh, for for heat and raw material and the steel process, or as they still and expect you to the expand and home use. So now we now uh, working for the uh, installation the stationary fuel cell. Well, um, <clears throat> to uh, in in order to, to create and expand the initial market, initial hydrogen market, the Ministry of Commerce and Industry is considering the subsidy scheme. For the hydrogen production and the supply, well, uh, to uh, the Green uh, Hydrogen Promotion Act, name, and I, I don't know that the ex exact name in the English, uh, which including this this subsidy uh, system is currently being the yeah, uh, debate in the, in the diet process. So next, uh, next. and uh, this is a kind of image for the uh, subsidy scheme uh, for 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 hydrogen production. Uh, yeah, well, we recognize that the very high uh, green hydrogen, including the green hydrogen, renewable hydrogen, quite uh, in quite expensive early and especially in, in early stages. We set in a, a strike prices and um uh, in the uh, so to provide the subsidy between the gap price gap between the green hydrogen and uh, and the fossil fuel over the 15 years. And this is a light one as I show the kind of threshold for the uh, current green hydrogen. Right. 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 Well, um, now there are several of the thresholds it's like decided by country by country. But in, in Japan, uh, we said the 3.4 kilogram CO2 emission per kilogram of hydrogen production. This is our current threshold for green hydrogen. So next week. So uh, from the, this slide, then I would like to show the, our activity. The NEDO is a uh, kind of funding agency and uh, the Ministry of Economic Trade and the Industry uh, to promote and organize and the national R&D uh, project into the demonstration. Well, and uh, this is our basic, basic strategy of R&D activities. We support for the, and based on the three pillars. One is uh, the fundamental, the applied research, mainly in the working on it working by the universities or national institutions. We're well, not so limited to the uh, r and in the research center. We need to, to test the technology in the, in the real field. So we are conducting the field tests and demonstration. Uh, to use the hydrogen in the real field, uh, well, and uh, we recognize the importance of regulation and the, the code and the standards uh, to use the hydrogen in the safety. These three pillars then must be uh, integrated, and also um, the public outreach and so getting the public acceptance to use uh, hydrogen for international cooperation or essential or activity. Well, we're now working on the, for the hydro hydrogen production, storage, transport, utilization, utilization so main battery, a fuel cell, hydrogen engines, hydrogen and the gas aviation. <clears throat> aviation propulsion system from e fill biofill, and well, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But today I'll bring some information about current activity on hydrogen production, kind of renewable hydrogen production. Next, please. Well, uh, this is our activity on the electrolysis. So we're now working for the electrolysis and the short stack. When the alkane electrolysis, PEM electrolysis. Also, they're working for the high temperature electrolysis, sort of IBC, or an annual exchange exchange membrane. Um, to yeah, to improve. Sí. Um, um, right. Funciona. Bueno, la elaboración de. To uh, well, to uh, to improve the uh, and the technologies. Uh, uh, we uh, need to to get back to back to basic. Back to basic, okay. And uh, um, <clears throat> there is a lot still and uh, sort of remain in the issue to to improve the technology, even in the PEM electrolysis, alkaline electrolysis. But um, 
So and the fundamental research uh, we now will need to de develop the kind of analysis technology between the what's going on at the kind of react and inside the electrolysis kind of reaction mechanism or uh, especially what deg degradation of a, of a bubble a bubble flow or a reverse current separator. And then also the working for the scaling up on the for system technology for the electrolysis. So next please. Well, <clears throat> we are now in uh, working uh, well, <clears throat> we are now working on the increasing the size of the low temperature and the water electrolysis. Here we are, I will introduce the, our effort in the alkaline electrolysis. Uh, we are uh, built a research facility and named the Fukushima Hydrogen Research Field or FH2L in, in 2020, 2020 uh, to develop the large scale water electrolysis. The uh, 10 megawatt and uh, uh, alkaline water electrolysis system was developed by Asahi Kase. It's, I suppose, the, it's uh, still the world's largest single stack. So, next, please. And then our um, uh, we are now uh, conducting the performance test and the balance conditions for 10 megawatt single stack. But next step is the scaling up. The idea is to scale up by and the lining up and the multiple units of 10 megawatt as a basic unit. And we are planning to develop the uh, 50 and the 60 megawatt scale water electrolysis system within a few years. Because the uh, 10 megawatts and not not in, enough for the commercial commercial scale, and uh, um, <clears throat> the water tank being the uh, the 15 16 megawatt water and the system uh, in the 16 16 megawatt system at uh, the hydrogen production product, production and by this uh, system I use it for the raw material for the uh, the chemical in the chemical product chemical industry like uh, for um, ammonia green ammonia something like that. But uh, for the energy uses and the 16 or, or 100 megawatts is not, not enough. We need we need kind of the scaling up. Well, um, but then uh, unfortunately, uh, there are only limited uh, uh, to the area, limited number of area to suitable for renewable energy in, in Japan. And uh, it's not possible uh, to cover all the demand uh, with the domestic renewable hydrogen. And also, uh, the major factor than the cost of the renewable hydrogen in the electricity prices. Therefore, we are considering that the branch produce the hydrogen using the local renewable electricity that outside Japan and import import it into, into the Japan. So next, please. The chart. Next, please. Yes, and uh, the challenge, a challenge is and how to how to concentrate and uh, uh, to the high hydrogen at, uh, to be at and distribute uh, to uh, for for the uh, international long uh, long <coughs> uh, long distance and the transportation. I mean, there are the several options for the hydrogen carrier and when working for the organic chemical hydrate and ammonia. And uh, today, as I bring some mention about uh, our liquefied on the hydrogen. And uh, transportation systems, uh, we already uh, developed a small but world first liquefied hydrogen tanker uh, left uh, left top top slide, and uh, our and the first and uh, second journey and uh, between the Japan and Australia uh, already and uh, completed with successfully. We continue this kind of work and uh, to get to secure the international standard code. And uh, for uh, collaborate with the uh, international maritime organization, but, and uh, it's and still uh, too small for for the, for the commercial. Uh, so um, we started on the commercial scale demonstration project. One of the big challenge is and the scaling up in the hydrogen carriers and uh, hydrogen well and hydrogen ships. Well, and this is the image and a uh, uh, light light bottom. Is this is the image for a uh, commercial scale and the high liquefied hydrogen tanker, and uh, well, and so huge amount of the hydrogen that can be carrier, then the hydrogen capacity uh, will be more than hundred times bigger as compared to the above the demonstration level. 
Uh, we started this project in 2021, and our feasibility study may conclude as soon as possible that the construction did, uh, may start uh, from the, this year. Well, thank you very much you know, for, <clears throat> for your attention, and I will close my presentation. Thank you.